Show of hands, how many of you guys heard of the song Jimmy Crack Corn? All right, Jamie, you paying attention? We, she hadn't heard of the song. 170-year-old song that's really embedded into our culture, and we like to come up with some interesting titles. So, you know, as soon as I wanted to present corn, I thought of the song. So it actually, I thought I'd better learn about the song because, uh, you know, it says Jimmy Crack Corn, but is it about corn? I kind of assumed it was about growing corn. And uh, it was actually one of Abe Lincoln's favorite songs. He used to love playing that song on the harmonica. So back in the uh, sort of the, the slave time, it's a slave time um, song about uh, a, a fella that, it was actually called the Blue Tail Fly. So it started off where this guy had to go around and, really literally swipe uh, flies off of the horse so it wouldn't bother the horse. So, so much into our culture, even Eminem had a remake of Jimmy Crack Corn. I, I can't tell you the lyrics because it's, it's, it's Eminem, but um, yeah, if you want to check it out, I'm, it's actually really horrible. <laughs> but my favorite rendition uh, is uh, from Homer Simpson here. We built this city on rock and roll. Something, something day. Not bad, eh? So, this is actually how I felt about corn when we first started this project about three years ago. I really didn't know anything about it, and it's one of the great things that I enjoy uh, with the job that we do is, is getting to learn about new crops and new applications. So, you know, corn is, is not a new crop, but it is new to us. And what we did over the, the next few years was, was try to really understand, you know, how does, what's the meaning of corn in, in Alberta? And the same way that I was trying to figure out the meaning of this song, because uh, there's actually a lot of controversy behind where it came from. So later on in the lyrics, the, the turns out that blue tail fly did bite the horse somewhere, kicked the guy off the horse, and he cracked his head and killed himself. So I'm thinking, well, this is like a, a kid's song. It's pretty, pretty graphic. So some people think it's the, the cracking of the skull where the crack corn came from. They say, what does Jimmy Crack Corn really mean? So the pretty cool thing that I found is, is crack corn really means corn whiskey. And uh, the slave who, who just lost his master probably just walked over and grabbed his bottle of whiskey and started drinking. So that's why he really doesn't care. Booze solves everything. So for our project then, we started off with basically some agronomy 101 for corn. We've talked about this a few times. The genetics that are available in corn now are, are, are really quite adaptable to uh, northern hemisphere type production and there's been lots of stories of expanded acres of corn and uh, we wanted to see, okay, well if this is true, we've got low heat unit corn, how do we grow it in, in Alberta, or, or for, for this case specifically, southern Alberta? And an important thing to, for us, we thought, was to look at population uh, and row spacing. And we do have rather short growing seasons here compared to um, a lot of the more corn belt traditional areas. We also have low moisture and, uh, you know, relatively short growing seasons. We also wanted to look at uh, basic fertility. So how does it respond to nitrogen specifically? And all of these now, the, the N equals eight means we have eight site years of data for that. And our locations were Lethbridge, Vauxhall, Bow Island, and, and Medicine Hat. And these were all dry land. So we, we kind of know corn, more irrigated crop around here in silage, but this was specifically, how do, how do we fit it into a dry land system? And, and, and that being the case, you know, how do we do zero till corn? We also thought that it'd be important to look at crop sequence. So where would we put this into our rotations? You know, we've, we've got pretty set rotations on dry land and, and how does corn fit in? So we, we did that uh, at a number of locations, just uh, Lethbridge, Vauxhall and Medicine Hat. And we did a whole bunch of different precursor crops. So I mentioned this has been a three year study. Um, I should actually take a, a quick step back. It was funded by, by ACIDF, the uh, Alberta Crop Industry Development Fund, and it was one of the last projects that this, this fund is actually funding because it's finished now. And I think that's a little bit sad, and I kind of want to give a, a plug out to that for especially all the lobby-type groups. You know, when we're looking at different innovative 
crops or projects. You know, I um, certainly love having the Canola Council and Commission around, but they don't really like funding corn and, uh, or, or things like hemp. So that's where Acid F really fit into the mix, is it gave us the opportunity to study so, so sort of other, other opportunities in the province. And I'm a little bit concerned that that's, uh, that's going away. Sorry, just got dry mouth all of a sudden there. Must have been all the drinking. That crack corn. So I wanted to quickly show you the, the weather the last three years because it really does play a factor into the results that we saw. And so 2015, when we first started the project, you'll see all of the four locations there kind of average about 60% normal of, of our moisture during the growing season. So really dry year and also really hot year, so 114% above normal on corn heat units. So we typically think that corn is a crop that needs lots of moisture, but what we found over the years is it's actually really incredibly drought tolerant. And, and we, two of the three years that we, we did the study on was, was incredibly dry. Now, 2016 was a little bit different, especially for Medicine Hat. They were the wet one this year. That, that was kind of weird. Lethbridge, you'll note, was, was pretty much bang on normal, 100%, 104% of moisture and 100% for corn heat units. But the other uh, three locations were still quite hot, so about 9% higher uh, for heat. So um, kind of a, a decent year 2016 was. And then 2017, we're back to almost the exact same environment we were in 2015, around 50%, 60% moisture. You'll notice that Vauxhall, that was really the hell hole this year, 42% moisture, so really, really dry, and uh, we, we definitely saw that in our, in our crops out there. And again, probably 11% above normal on heat, so, so think of that moving forward. We had two out of the three years were incredibly dry and hot. To look specifically at Lethbridge, um, this was the accumulated moisture, and you'll note that I put those little bars in there that are all the same height. The, the big difference, honestly, was mostly a hotter May. So I'm not sure if, you know, given the planting dates for corn, although this year we were out quite early, about this, uh, I think May 2nd, we planted the majority of our corn plots, but uh, a good majority of the heat, extra heat that we got this year was early in the spring. And there's our, our moisture, moisture situation. It was actually quite a beautiful spring. We had lots of moisture, nice kind of flat windows there where we were able to get our seeding done. And then around June 15th, we flatlined and, and just the tap shut off and that's, that's what we had. So pretty dramatic year as far as, as moisture was concerned. So this is just a quick shot of our Monosem planter. And, and this was honestly the majority of the, the learning curve in moving into a row crop is is understanding the intricacies of a vacuum planter, but you'll note that the precision that it has there is pretty incredible, and, and the corn growers and soybean growers in other parts of the country and the U.S., they've really learned how to do a, a, a very great job at managing sort of spacing between seeds and what's optimal for their area. And the planters do a wonderful job as far as depth control, they're on a parallel length uh, system, um, but they're actually, you know, it, it takes a bit of skill in learning how to set them properly, but we found over the last few years, including with our canola project, that there's a lot of potential. The, the one thing that I did see right off the bat, though, is that these planters honestly weren't designed for zero tillage, and we still have more work to do to get them set up to really fit nicely into our into our dryland cropping systems. Especially this spring, we noticed some issues as far as uh, ability to penetrate the soil. We had 30 plus degrees in May. With that moisture, we had some pretty hard crusting. So, you know, there, there are ways to adapt, you know, spring pressure and the other, the other side of it is proper residue management. So precursor crops ended up being quite important. And then, uh, you know, being able to adapt these to air cart systems is still sort of the next step. So they're really more readily usable for the scale of farming that we do. So to look at our pop and spacing, uh, this shot actually showed um, 
<clears throat> how amazingly different plant growth can be just by varying your row spacing and planting population. So corn, it doesn't really like to have other plants nearby. It will compete with itself and was really, really quite surprised at the, the difference in growth within just something as minor as changing seeding rate and a little bit of row spacing. This study, we did 20 inch row spacing and 30 inch row spacing. And you'll note on the left, this is uh, our planting population spread. On, on, we went from 15,000 to 35,000 seeds per acre. And on the left is the 20 inch row spacing and all of our uh, percent of target is quite high. So at the low seeding rate, you see we're actually above what we were shooting for. So that was just pure magic. I don't know how that happened. But overall, ended up close to 100% seed. So as you go to narrower rows, you actually reduce the amount of seed in that row. So there's less interplant competition. And even just moving an extra 10 inches wide on the right side, the 30 inch row spacing, as we move up in plant population, our actual survival ship or percent emergence decreases. So all the way up to 35 or 30,000, 35,000 seeds per acre, we're, we're losing 20% uh, of our mortality. So, so that kind of showed us too that maybe this 20 inch row spacing has some merit. So the overall yield curves, it turns out our, 20, our narrower rows um, definitely out yielded the 30 inch row spacing. And interestingly enough, uh, we did see a yield response all the way up to around 30,000 seeds per acre, which is a little bit of a surprise because when we started looking at the project, we looked at South Dakota and the farming that they were doing and they predicted around, uh, Dwayne Beck in particular predicted 20,000 uh, on 20 inch rows is probably gonna work out the best for us, but it turns out this is why we do regionally based work it's probably worth the extra seed in this case. So the seed companies will like me on this one. And on the 30 inch row, it actually never did uh, start to, to back off. So um, it, it just, it, as much as it hurts and seed's expensive, it, it seems to be worth the investment. And this was eight, eight site years, so it's a pretty good data set. We maxed out on, on an average yield at around 75 bushels an acre. Now that's where the seed companies aren't happy with me because they expect we should be, be able to do 120, 130 bushels per acre dry land. Maybe we can, um, but like I mentioned earlier, there was two years of drought. And in all honesty, I think 75 to 80 bushels an acre of corn compared to probably 38 bushels per acre of wheat. Um, it, it might, it's pretty actually amazing that it did as well as it did, I think. So on to the fertility study, this one actually really threw me for a loop because again, we have eight site years of data and for the most part, fairly low background nitrogen to start. That's what's in brackets at the top of the slide. We literally had no response to nitrogen. So if we're gonna spend more money on seed, we may be able to cut back on nitrogen. And you know, it, it's, we've got this in our mind that corn is, is a really big hog of nitrogen, but you know, you have to remember too that in, in Iowa and places like that, when they're growing 300 bushel corn, that's gonna need a lot more nitrogen. So 70 or 80 bushel corn, really actually quite nitrogen efficient. So this one um, is a pretty interesting result. We, we tried a few different split timings. There may be some potential for some in-season foliar applications, but really the long and the short of it is it was a pretty flat response. Here you are, Brian. Can you read that? So that's Brian making some corn husk dolls at open farm days. And his were actually pretty good, I was impressed. Yeah, I just do that one. So onto our crop sequencing study. We basically just planted a bunch of different crops that are typical and maybe not so typical in, uh, in a dry land production. So we did corn, soybeans, wheat, peas, lentils, canola, and mustard. We planted these in year one and then in year two, we followed up and planted corn into everything. And we did two types of seeding systems. One of them was a, a t had a tillage pass and the other one was direct seeded. So this is what it looked like in Lethbridge this year. And you'll notice there's some, some spottiness and I think I've, yeah. So some of these plots that I've circled here, they're, they're really patchy. That's the corn on corn 
under direct seeding. So we didn't do a great job in managing that residue. So right away, that was a bit of an issue that we flagged. Um, I think there's some answers on how to deal with it, but quite honestly, in the plots, we didn't do a great job of it. So we had poor emergence following crops that had lots of residue. This is the blocks that were conventional. So we would have tilled ahead of time. The planter did a fabulous job, really, really nice and even. But you'll also notice that, that they actually look fairly dry and, and there's the odd plot that looks greener within those blocks. Those are when we were following like a pea or a lentil. So this year with the drought that we've had, we really do notice uh, crop sequence effects and we also notice tillage effects. So um, throughout the season, even though the conventional stuff looked great at the beginning, later on when that drought kicked in, the zero till, even just that one pass of cultivation, made a really big difference on how that corn performed. This is just another overshot that Mike put together and you kind of sort of see that, that the bottom part there, everything came up nice and even. Uh, the top, some of them struggled with residue and, and that, was, that was something that's, that I think we can adjust for but was still important to deal with. So I've got some close-up shots that will hopefully you guys can be able to see the, some of the distance, differences between them. So these first ones are tillaged, corn after soybeans, looks nice. Wheat, not too bad. Lentils look nice. And then there's canola. Now, the neat thing about being able to see this in, in, a, in a small plot setting was right off the bat in the spring, we noticed that corn after canola and corn after mustard didn't look as nice. So I'll, I'll kind of flip back and forth between the lentils and the canola. And you can kind of see that the plants are, are a little bit more yellow. There's a little bit of purpling. They're even stunted a little bit. And this is something that a lot of people have known about, but it's, the, it's because cano canola and mustard are non-mycorrhizal crops, and corn really needs that mycorrhiza to have access to, to phosphorus early in the springtime, especially since we're seeding sometimes into cool soils. And this actually did show up in a, in a yield effect, so you know, the learning here is, is try not to corn, plant corn after canola or mustard. So corn after corn surprisingly does quite well. After peas it looks good, and then mustard again, kind of looking a little bit yellower, a little bit stunted, and that's that mycorrhizal effect again. When we move to zero till, now we can really notice that the crops that had really low residue did quite well. So it's just really a matter of being able to get that seed to soil contact and avoid hairpinning. Wheat caused a little bit of problem with residue and in all honesty, I think if we put on better residue managers or adjusted them better, we could probably deal with that. Lentils are looking nice. Canola is not so great, corn is horrible, and the peas are nice. Mustard, not so great. So when we looked at all of the data that we had on this one, we did get an 8% yield bump in a direct seeding situation. So that's not insignificant, I think that's a, that's a pretty big deal. So we, we know that moisture is our limiting factor here in southern Alberta, so It'll be important for us to figure out ways to adapt those planters to do a really good job at direct seeding. When we look at how it performs after the precursor crops, we're kind of lumped into two groups. The wheat, mustard, and canola did the poorest, and corn, after corn, peas, lentils, and soybeans, corn did the, the, the best, and those were significant differences. And we're talking about, again, probably an 8% yield difference. So because we've identified the issue with the planters, and, and this is something that's going on in other parts of the corn growing areas as well, and this is the concept of strip tillage. I'm not sure that this is where we need to go, but I wanted to show you the, 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 the principles behind it because I think they're interesting. Basically, they, they go in in the fall with these types of implements, and this is one that uh, Dwayne Kirchner put together for somebody um, here in Alberta. I can't remember who it was but you, you, the principle is, is you go in the fall and it basically has a shank and you put your fertilizer down deep. So they, they like to deep bend their phosphorus and potassium 
in the fall around 10 inches deep. And then they follow up with these little uh, closing discs and then uh, just a roll cage. And you end up with this uh, kind of nice blackened little strip. You're not completely tilling everything, so you're sort of trying to do the best of both worlds. And then the following year, you'll seed directly into those black strips. So the nice thing is, is that you've sort of managed the residue already. It's black, it warms up a little bit better in the spring. So we're kind of toying around the idea with this in, uh, in, in you know, maybe even some of our, our canola trials using a planter, but it's just something that we're, we're thinking about. So this is also a new um, floating residue manager that Dwayne's built. And I think the problem with our, our, our previous residue managers is that they had those bolts and you had to manually lift it up and down. So, so this one actually floats, it raises and lowers based on the contour of land. So we bought these for our planters and we're gonna try them out and see if they make a difference. And I think this is just the front view of how they look. So they basically push the residue aside so that the planter does a good job going into that row. So I'll end off with a couple of jokes. There you can buy some watermelon. This is my favorite. <laughs> I don't know where Mike found this one, but it was perfect. So just to end with some economics, and I, I really hate e economics, so sorry, Mr. KPMG, but you can make these spreadsheets and make them say whatever you want. But this was, I borrowed this from Manitoba. Just kidding, man, economists are cool. And so this is from, from Manitoba. It's, it's just a spreadsheet looking at costs and such. And I, I put in the 80 bushels an acre that we kind of averaged. And our local market price around here for grain corn is around $5.30 a bushel. So using all of, uh, you know, the, the seed costs were around 30,000 seeds, at, so the 81 bucks. But I also just kept it blank the way they did it with their fertility. So, you know, we're losing money basically, 50 bucks an acre with, with the standard sets. But, you know, uh, the, the, I, I can play with spreadsheets and make them look pretty too. So now all of a sudden we're making $110. And all I did was reduce the fertilizer down to 20 because our, our study showed that, you know, there's very little response to nitrogen anyways, and I know it's a tough thing to do, but let's cut back on nitrogen. I removed the drying cost too because we didn't really need to dry last year. It doesn't mean that, uh, that farmers wouldn't need to be set up with dryers, but they had a $35 an acre drying. And then I, I bumped the, the yield to 90 because, you know, two out of the last three years have been drought, right? And I added $10 an acre for, for throwing your cows out there to feed on the leftover residue. And then magically we're, we're making $110 an acre. So it's, it's, it's fun to talk about economics, but um, you know, this is going to be what it is for you. And uh, I think you know, these were not unreasonable changes that I made, but even at 80, 90 bushels an acre, uh, I, I do think that there's potential for corn. And I think that more and more guys are are trying it and there is a there is a pretty decent market around here with the feed industry that we have so you know it's something to consider so final thoughts I just mentioned I think it has some some pretty decent potential it's a pretty amazing crop it really does you know it continues to grow um, well into the nice you know August weather that we have a lot of our other crops they're dry and dead and we, we seem to be wasting uh, this nice weather in August, and I think corn really takes advantage of that extra heat that we have, August, September. It looks like the narrower rows are better, although that kind of complicates things for harvest because a lot of the headers are set up on 30 inch row spacing, but you know, there's probably an, an option for that. I'm not exactly sure what it is yet. Looks like 30,000 seeds per acre on dry land actually did perform the best. Uh, we didn't have a lot of response to nitrogen. And the overall best performance was after low residue legume type crops. And Kenny cracked corn and no one cares. So if that's it, thank you. Are there any questions? All right, oh, Rusty.
What cost? Just nitrogen. Oh. I think it's about a bushel and a, or a pound and a half per bushel, somewhere around there. Any other questions? Thank you. Let's put our hands once uh, more together for Ken Coles. Thanks, Ken. And of course, you know, he's not going anywhere. So he